Okay, our seventh study in Ruth, I want to remind you that we will not meet the next three Tuesdays. I say this so the video audience can hear this as well. We will not have Tuesday on the 24th or the 31st of October, and we will not meet on the first Tuesday of November, which I think is the 7th or 8th. I don't know, 8th. Anyway, the reason for that is travel. Natasha and I go... Um, we minister in Aruba next week for one night and we sit for three days, which is nice. Um, and then we come home and then we go back on Halloween. We go to Europe and preach in the Netherlands. So we do a conference there and we, are, we do four services in, in conference. Then we do two churches and uh, really excited about where God's got, you know, going to take us. I've never preached in Europe, so this is kind of a cool, cool uh, opportunity. Um, Doing a little Matthew 24 teaching in the Netherlands, uh, teaching our third book, Righteous Saul, Righteous Paul. So we get to do some, a little bit of eschatology. We do a little bit of righteousness. Should be a fun event. And then the next Tuesday, we're a little R&R, &R and then we'll be home. So we'll miss three in a row, but we'll be back here the second Tuesday of November, and we'll finish Ruth. Tonight's number seven. There's eight of them, as far as I can see. Uh, there is one more I want to do that's following tonight, so we'll, we'll take this little hiatus and come back and close this down. We'll have to talk about the Thanksgiving because that will be like the next one after we come back. So that's Thanksgiving's week. Maybe we don't want to meet then. Um, you guys uh, let me know what's going on that week for you. Uh, tonight our lesson is the nearer kinsman. The reason it's called the nearer kinsman is because Boaz is not first in line. And you know the story of Ruth that I'm not going to give you the entire condensed version or the elongated version. Hopefully you've read this story by now, and if you're seven lessons in, you know what's up. Boaz is our character who, is, who rides onto the scene as, in, from a Christian perspective as the Jesus character. He's the Redeemer. He is the one who will offer redemption to Ruth. But before we do that, before we get into the reading, and I don't have a lot tonight, I, I want to talk about um, this, kins, this nearer kinsman as an allegory and as a type for Christians. And I want to talk about Boaz as the kinsman, as the type of Jesus for Christians. But one of the things I've tried to do on this journey through Ruth is to get you to think differently about this book. And to do so by thinking about it as not a love letter, as not a, sto a romance story, at least not primarily, but rather as a piece of literature that was possibly a bit subversive, um, a bit protest, a piece of literature that might have been tossed in probably like a grenade into the room um, in a world that had gotten a little hyper excited over um, a sort of religious renewal. And what I mean specifically is Ezra and Nehemiah are bringing back the construction of the wall of Jerusalem and they're reconstructing the temple and they're bringing God's people back from Babylonian captivity. And in doing so, they're laying down some rules that they're seeing in Torah. And one of, those, one of their, the ones that they really sort of decide to hang their hat on is that Israelites shouldn't be married to Moabites. The Moabites are the enemy and that you shouldn't congregate with them. The Torah says they don't belong in the temple up to 10 generations. And so they put a very, very, very well-defined line in the sand between the people of God and everybody else. And the people they pick are Moabites because the Moabites have a bad track record of how they dealt with God's people. The Moabites are the source of a lot of pain, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, trouble, a lot of death. It's the Moabites who try to curse Israel under that whole Balaam, Balak story. It's the Moabites who send in um, the Moabites. Women come into the camp of Israel to try and uh, sway the, the, the warrior class of Israel. And there's a whole, there's pages and pages and pages in the history, uh, even in the Old Testament, of the conflict between Moab and Israel. So if you're going to pick an enemy, you pick someone who's done you some harm. Or pick an enemy that seems pretty obvious that everybody can rally around. Ezra and Nehemiah institute this idea that there needs to be a separation between those races of people and those nationalities, and they even go all the way to splitting up families. And so homes get split apart, and women and children get sent back to Moab. And, and it's a devastating little, two little letters. I'm not saying there's not great things in Ezra and Nehemiah, but there are some devastating things. That brings me to this point. There can be devastating things in a letter and beautiful things in a letter all at the same time because there's a lot going on inside of these letters. And one of the reasons why the Bible is so difficult for us, and I'm going to say that again, and I want to say it slower because not everybody even agrees with what I said, so I want to double down on it. 
One of the reasons why the Bible is so difficult for us. People don't always agree with that. No, they don't. Because a lot of people will say stuff like the Bible's really simple. It says what it says, means what it means, really clear. Just read it and you'll find out. I think, well, good luck with that. If you really take it serious, it has a lot to say. And it's not always saying it right on the surface. And one of the reasons why the Bible is difficult for us there, I said it three times, is because we don't read it through the lens of the people that wrote it. And let me give you an example. You are not a slave in Egypt. You are not dispersed into a foreign power a thousand miles from your home living in someone else's territory. You do not have a military occupier in your backyard telling you what to do. I just described to you the three major cultural settings of every book of the Bible. The front part of your Bible is written by a people who have spent centuries in slavery at the bottom of the pile. And now they're getting to stretch their legs a little bit. And they're getting to fill their lungs with freedom just a little bit. And right on the heels of that, the next chunk of your Bible is written by people who were invaded by a foreign power, pulled out of their homes, taken kidnapped and captive to a foreign land and forced to live there for generations and only slowly allowed to come back into a land that used to be theirs, but now is overrun with all kinds of stuff. And then when you get to the New Testament, you're reading a people who have the iron fist of the Roman Empire crushing them down and telling them how they will live. They don't have self-governance. They don't have the freedom to do or to be or to say what they want. And you and I don't know anything about those three situations. We have them maybe in our history, we have them in our past, and maybe we have slices of them in our lives, but relatively, we're secure, and we're safe, and we're wealthy, and we're winners. Like, in the grand scheme of things. This is why we don't understand the Bible. Because we read it from our point of view. And we almost always end up taking the wrong side because that's what happens when you've never listened to the way the other people sound. So if this is not a top-down book, but rather a bottom-up book, people on the bottom finally getting their voices heard, then it changes the way you hear it if you're listening from the top. I hope I'm making sense with that. And it's why the Bible then becomes an... We, we end up trying to weaponize scriptures we often don't understand that weren't written from our perspective or to us. And if our ear is only finely tuned to the way things sound to us, then we will read the Bible through that lens and then when someone comes along and gives an alternate way of seeing it, they'll immediately be wrong and a heretic and we don't want anything to do with that. And it might be that they're trying to speak those verses from the bottom instead of from the top. And so one thing that has helped me, not there, but is helping me in Bible study, is to try and see the Bible where I can through the lens of or the voice of the victim. Why do I bring this up with Ruth? Because if there's ever a book in the Bible that it'll help you to understand it if you read it from the bottom up or you read it from the victim's point of view, it's Ruth. It's easy to read Ruth and only see Boaz marries a woman and here comes baby David. But when you are presented with the possibility that Ruth is a letter about the outsider and the stranger being accepted in spite of themselves, and that what it might be trying to do is to preach a message to a world that is crushing all Moabites. And here comes this little letter of Ruth that goes, maybe don't be so fast to crush Moabites. Maybe without a Moabite, we wouldn't even have our own King David. And if we don't have our own King David and the narrative's on its way to a genealogy that opens the New Testament that leads through David all the way to Jesus. And we're going to deal with that next week. 
or next, mess, next lesson in a few weeks when we deal with the final part of Ruth because you got to go genealogy. You're going to land at a genealogy in Ruth and then lo and behold, the New Testament's going to open with one. So there's more that meets the eye there and there's a reason why that exists. So where you can, make it your, cha- make it your mission to try and see the Bible through the lens of the people, not who are on the top, but who are on the bottom. The people who are writing from a place of oppression, from a place of being crushed. And man, it changes how we see some of these texts. And it changes maybe our perspective, at least a little bit, on what we do with them. Let's read the first six verses of Ruth 4. This is, of course, the final chapter of Ruth. What I want to do tonight is I want to work on the redemption process a little bit. We've already done this in a way. We've already talked about the fact that kinsman redemption is a thing. Okay, we even walked you through the Old Testament. All the scriptures where, you know, Ruth knows that she gets to come and glean the fields. And we've talked and talked and talked about the the kinsman redemption, the leveret marriage, about how if a man dies and he hasn't had a son, then his nearest relative marries the widow and has a son, but that son's not his, that son's the, the man who died. So that property and possession stay within the family. Stay within the family name. And so the Leverett marriage. And then we even told you that Jesus replaces that for us because Jesus puts us in the family. Christ comes along and, and brings us into the kingdom inheritance. And gives us what we don't deserve. And, and, and brings us in through His love and through a heavenly marriage. And then that motif runs all the way through Revelation. You want to see the Lamb's bride? You get to the end of Revelation and there we are, married to Jesus. So we've already talked about that. What we haven't dealt with is this pesky nearer kinsman, this guy that for some reason is in the story that should redeem Ruth. He gets the chance to do that first. I I think I told you this last time. To me, the book works without him. Like you wouldn't need him. Like you could have ended the chapter, the third chapter with Boaz going, I'll redeem you. And then here comes the bride. Chapter four is a big celebration wedding and Boaz and Ruth get married. Why do we have to take this seemingly left turn? into this whole scenario of the nearer kinsman. Is it just so we can see Boaz did things legally? Maybe maybe that's one of them. But maybe there's a little something more there. So let's read those six verses and then let's talk about it. Boaz went up to the gate and he sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So here he is, the nearer kinsman. And Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside and he sat down and He took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Don't don't rush too quickly past the number 10. 10's a number that the Hebrews love to use that almost always denotes something to do with the law or government um, if if for no other reason that the Decalogue exists. The fact that the Ten Commandments are the underpinning of the Mosaic. So the author could have said 9, could have said 11, could have said 50, could have said a bunch of guys. But he specifically says 10, and he brings 10 elders in. So it's getting the reader to think in legal terms. 10 men, they're elders. That means they're leaders. They sit down. Verse 3. He said to the close relative, this is Boaz talking, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, she sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. A couple points of order. Naomi's obviously sold the land she owned in the family, the land that had belonged to Elimelech. Maybe they sold it on their way out of Bethlehem. Maybe she sold it when they got back from Moab. But for whatever cause, Naomi has nothing left. Husband's gone. Sons are gone. One of her daughters-in-law is gone. She's got this hanger on daughter-in-law and no property, no possessions. And without this, she has no future. And we talked about the fact that Jesus brings us a redemption. And redemption is not simply buying us from sin, but giving us an inheritance. That was one of our lessons. All right. And so Boaz says to the man, you're the nearest relative. It's yours if you want it. And notice how quick he is to say, yep, I want it. As long as there's some property involved, house or two, some money, couple of cars, count me in. I want it all. Boaz drops the bomb in verse 5. Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess. And I want you to notice that he throws her title in there. 
which seems like it should be completely unnecessary to call her Ruth the Moabitess. There is nobody named Ruth in their whole land. And yet, here's this new Ruth, but this, don't think about this from Boaz. Think about this from the writer. Read this bottom up. Don't read this top down. The writer of the story wants to remind you she's not supposed to be here. She's Moabitess. They're not allowed in. They're not allowed in the temple. You're not supposed to marry them. Just warning you, if you buy this land, you got to get Ruth the Moabitess. She's the wife of the dead to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative suddenly has a change of heart. He realizes, oh, I don't need that land as much as I thought I did. I can't redeem it for myself. Lest I ruin my own inheritance, you redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Um, got any ideas why he had a change of heart all of a sudden in the middle of the redemption process? When he wanted the land, he was cool with the house, you know, whatever else there is. But the moment he realized that he had to marry Ruth, the Moabitess, suddenly, you know, I don't want to ruin my own inheritance even though ruining his own inheritance didn't seem to be that big of a deal as long as all he got was somebody else's property. Because the moment he has to marry Ruth, what he means by ruin my own inheritance is the moment he marries Ruth, he has to bear a child with her. And when he bears a child with her, that child is not his firstborn. That child is Elimelech's grandson. And that means he gets Elimelech's stuff. And now that piece of property that I'm glad to buy isn't mine. It's that baby's. So, you know, I'm good. <laughs> I mean, I don't need it as much as I thought that I needed it. There's a nearer kinsman than Boaz. So because there's a nearer kinsman, there's a legal obligation to give him the right, the first right of redemption. Or in our legalese, first right of refusal, which is exactly what he does. He refuses. Orthodox interpretation of this sees him as the closest relative to Naomi and thus a personification of the law as the closest relation to national Israel. Now, I capitalize law here to make law the nearer kinsman. We're going to name him law for purposes of our little skit. The law is quick to take the property, but is unwilling to wed the Moabitess. Perhaps the author is subtly exposing the weakness of the law, which is quick to take and slow to give. Have you noticed that? Legalism, in all of its forms, is quick to take. Take your joy, take your peace, take your freedom. Slow to give, so slow to give, it delays all promises until after the grave. You want abundant life? That's called eternal life. You can have that when you die. In the meantime, jump through this hoop, this hoop, this hoop, and this hoop. The nearer kinsman is quick to take the properties, slow to take anything else. Let's filter that idea of a faulty near kinsman through the ideology or the wording of the New Testament. Look at Hebrews 8. I threw in an extra verse than I needed to set the context up for the one I want, which is 7, but it's, look at 6. But now he, of course, this is Jesus. Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Because if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Reverse engineer these two verses. Seventh verse. We've got a second covenant which was sought out by God because there was a fault with the first one. Okay. If you keep reversing it, you go back through a guy giving you better covenant and better promises. Why better? Because the first set wasn't as good. And the reason the first set wasn't as good is because man took the law and made it an instrument for his own righteousness. And you can't take the law as an instrument for your own righteousness without doing damage, plain and simple, to both the law and to the recipients of the law. And it's so in our nature to add to the law and to use it for righteousness that 
it's better to stay away from it as a teaching tool even, lest people determine their value based on their ability to keep it and determine their guilt based on their inability to keep it. Better would be to preach the gospel. Good news, Jesus has redeemed you from the curse of the law. Good news, righteousness, peace, and joy are the elements of the kingdom of God. They can belong to you, and here's how. You, you, you can wear yourself out coming up with good news and never wear it out. It's so good. I was teaching from Luke Two today on the DDP. I'm trying to record way out in advance because we got a lot of travel. And, and, and the angels descend into a field full of shepherds. And they say, good news. I, we bring to you good news. Good news of great joy which shall be to all people. I think that King James says, glad tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And I saw, and, and this is what I shared with our audience, a three pronged idea of how we should determine what good preaching is made up of. Not funny stories, not smooth moves and transitions from one segment to the other. Good tidings. Great joy, all people. So if it's not good news and it doesn't bring you great joy and it's not equal for every hearer, something's wrong with it. Because the angels say, we're giving you this baby and here's three things he's going to do. Good news, great joy for all people. Bad news that sucks the life out of you and only some super smart people qualify anyway is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, less than good news in any way that doesn't bring the joy of the Lord, which is your strength, that you have to jump through hoops of performance to even qualify for is not for all people and cannot be what Jesus has come to do. Better covenant, better promises. Better than what? Better than all that other garbage. Better than the idea that there's something you need to do to get God's attention. Better than the idea that, oh, well, joy, is, is, joy comes on the other side. But that's not for our walk now. Or better news than some people qualify because they're God's chosen people. That's terrible news. Some people qualify because God picked them. Guess who he picked? It's always us. Because we read top down. It's always us. Picked us. Didn't pick them. That's good news. That's bad news. So a better covenant built on better promises. And you might say, well, why did God give a bad covenant? He didn't give a bad covenant. He had a fault in it. The fault is that we were in covenant with the perfect one who is God. And our fault is that we don't keep our end of any deal. We just don't do it. And if you're going to base a covenant on my ability to keep it, I'm in trouble. So Jesus comes as the recipient of a new covenant, in covenant with his Father, a better covenant built on better promises, seeks a place for us to have a second, and so we can move past the fault of the first. Here's how Paul says it. I don't give Hebrews to Paul, but I'll give Romans to Paul. Romans 8, 1 to 4, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You're not, you're not out from under law. You're just out from under the law for righteousness. You still have a law. It's called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He's a, good, he's a good lawgiver. I'm under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, but I'm no longer under the law of sin and death. Three, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Look at the problem with the law. It's weak when, it's tried, when you try to approach it in the flesh. It's weak. God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, Jesus condemned sin 
in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law that ought to be circled in your Bible if it's not circled or underlined or you know big star or something right there at the start of verse 4 the righteous requirement of the law would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit see there is a righteous requirement of the law but it is not according to flesh look at the first part of verse 3 the law can't do it it's weak through the flesh you can't keep the law through the flesh and when you try you make a mockery of both it and yourself and so the law can't be kept through flesh it's weak through flesh that's the new testament approach to what's faulty about the first covenant and what is superior about the second so we have a new kinsman and are made and i use a uh, a quote from ephesians we studied this together we've been made accepted in the beloved jesus and we are in jesus therefore accepted as jesus we do not because we have a new kinsman because we are accepted we do not stone the offender we forgive them 70 times seven we do not condemn faults we offer the gift of no condemnation our heavenly boaz has done what our nearer kinsman, and I put this in parentheses because this is our nearer kinsman. The nearer kinsman is the law of sin and death, our own flesh, our own performance. That nearer kinsman couldn't do what the heavenly Boaz can do. What can the heavenly Boaz do? He marries us even though we're Moabites. So the nearer kinsman can't do what the farther kinsman can do. So the more I see it through that lens, the, the happier that I am that the book of Ruth throws this nearer kinsman in. Because it gives us a chance, reading from the bottom up, to imagine ourselves as the audience. And what's the thing we know the most? The law. In fact, it's the law they're trying to use to kick Moabites out. They're quoting the Torah to break up families and marriages and send women and children back across into, the, into Moab. And so if I'm reading this bottom up, I'm going, who's the nearest kinsman to my people? Who do we, who ha what have we turned to, to identify us, to redeem us? And the answer is we've turned to the faultiness of the law with its righteous requirements that we're trying to keep through our flesh. And isn't rejecting people based upon their nationality? Hmm or where they came from or how different they look from me or how different they are isn't that fleshly isn't that weak it's kind of miserly yeah isn't it less than who we are as a people when you read it through that lens it becomes obvious there's a nearer kinsman and boaz goes there's somebody that's nearer to you let's see if he can save you and so this part of the story is an interesting little part because, of course, he can't save you. He's, he, wants to, he wants what you got, but he doesn't want to marry himself to you. I think, for me, religion is not a bad word, okay? I like to put an adjective in front of it to make it a bad word. It's toxic, then it's bad. There's toxic religion. And there's pure religion, according to James. And we've used this before. I think we might have done this last week or the week before. We even took you to James and said, pure religion undefiled is to care for the widows and the fatherless, keep yourself unspotted from the world. So James thought there was such thing as pure religion. If there's pure religion, there's toxic religion. Well, we've been in toxic religion. Most of us got, could write a book on it, on what it did to us and what it's still doing to us. And the pain is caused. We could condemned put pressure on, put a distance between you and God. God's always mad at you. You're always behind his back and weren't in his favor. He had to earn everything. And it, it just completely negated the finished work of Christ. That's toxic religion. It ought to be run from, never run towards. Um, as a word or as a concept, it's not a bad thing because it, it, it can be a codified set of beliefs around which you identify yourself as a follower of a God or a system. That is your religion. Which is why I gladly call my religion Christianity. I, my codified beliefs rally around the anointed man, Christ Jesus. He who raised from the dead. I 
identify as someone who follows him, someone who follows that. When I think of religion in the toxic sense, I think of something that steals from me, that kills me, that destroys me. Jesus said, every man who's come before me is a thief and a robber. He said, the thief come not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And to soften that blow and to remove the responsibility from us, because we read the Bible top down, we made that to be the devil. And so people will go, well, the devil steals, kills, and destroys. But Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, every man who's came before me is a thief and a robber. He goes, I'm the only way in. Every other way is stealing from you. It's stealing something from you. Your hopes, your dreams, your passions, your, your peace, your, I don't, insert here what you don't have as much of now as you had before you sold your soul to that. And that stole from you and it thieved you and it robbed you and it won't give it back because it doesn't give its property back. It took your inheritance. It slapped the money down and it took it from you. He goes, I'm better than that. I'm the door. I'm the way in. Everybody else a thief and a robber. Come in through me. You can come in and out and find pasture. It's Jesus saying, there's a nearer kinsman than me. He's easy to find. Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror and try to buy yourself. Go for it. Your strong arm or your flesh can only change you so much. It cannot save you. He's the nearest kinsman you have. But once you're exhausted with him and once you realize that he won't wed you, he won't marry you because he doesn't want to produce anything with you. I'll be waiting here, Jesus says. I'm your next kinsman. And so the Ruth story is to show us that the thing nearest to us, the thing we've identified with, can't save us. But it is the one who has chosen us. See, you have been chosen by God. You didn't stumble into the faith. You didn't accidentally come to Jesus. You're just not that smart. You're, 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 too, you're too close to your nearer kinsman. He has to, you have to, you'd have to be exhausted off that nearer kinsman to come to Jesus. That's what we did, but we, we, he found us. It's like that line in Forrest Gump when Lieutenant Dan says, Someone asked me if I found Jesus. What about you, Gump? Have you found Jesus? And Forrest says, I didn't know I was supposed to be looking for him. <laughs> I remember laughing out loud when I watched that the first time and thought, it's exactly right. I didn't know I was supposed to be looking for him. You aren't supposed to be looking for him. You're the lost sheep. The shepherd comes to find you. What you do is you respond to his call. And that's, that's Ruth. So we have our nearer kinsman. Let's close this out. Verse 7, and I want to talk one more real quick thing, and then we'll read out. This was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was confirmation in Israel. Of all the verses in Ruth, Ruth 4-7 is one of the best timing verses for Ruth. I don't know if you caught it, but there are two things inside that verse that darn near prove. One of them you can see if you're watching for it. The other one you can't see yet. You'll see it in a minute. But there are two things inside that verse that darn near prove it doesn't fall where it falls in your Christian Bible. That it probably falls closer to where it falls in your Hebrew Bible. Much further up the timeline. This is probably not a story in the Judges. Written in the time of the Judges. It's placed in the time of the Judges, but probably a story written in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. One reason is because this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. At the time of the Judges, it was still the custom. You wouldn't write at the time of the book of Judges. In former times, we did it this way. You would only write that if you were writing it 600 years later about an event that you're placing in the past. Okay, so there's a timing there. The other has to do with taking off the sandal and giving it to the other person. I'm going to borrow some Robert Alter. 
Just, you know, I'm, I'm smart enough to know that this guy's way smarter than I am at reading Hebrew. And so I just give it to you straight from Alter's commentary on this. I think this is telling. The man would remove his sandal and give it to his fellow man. That's the quote. That's from Ruth 4. There is no certainty as to who gives the sandal to whom or what exactly it signifies. In the enunciation of the Leveret law, we've talked about the law of Leveret marriage, given in Deuteronomy 25.9, it's the widow who removes the sandal from the brother-in-law who has refused to marry her, and she then spits in his face. Which I always thought was a pretty cool scene in Deuteronomy 25. So the removal of the sandal in Deuteronomy is clearly a sign of disgrace. In our text, there's no indication of disgrace. Why would there be? The removal of the sandal seems to be a legal ritual for the transfer of an obligation or of property, perhaps from the kinsman to Boaz. I like this sentence. The seeming confusion here about the details of this ritual may reflect the writer's distance from the time when it was practiced. So quite obviously in the text, this is the way they did it in old times. I'm gonna, now here's the less obvious one. I'm gonna try to describe to you what they did and I'm gonna get it wrong because I wasn't there and I'm just gonna tell you they took the shoes off. And I forgot about that spit in the face part and I also forgot that it was supposed to be largely negative, but in my version of the story, it seems like a pretty positive thing. You slip off your shoe, not sure what you do with it, but there it is. Now, you can also, we've done this in Christianity, go, well, Moses slipped his shoes off his feet because the ground where he walked was holy. And so what Boaz is trying to do is show that in the marriage ceremony, it's holy. And so he takes Ruth in. Feels like a real big stretch to me to get to that. So what I will say is, is that this is another indication that the author is probably writing something for a time that is not the time in which his story is placed, which puts us back to the Ruth or the Ezra Nehemiah passage. All right, let me close with reading a few verses that gets us ready to transition the next time we're together, this is 8 to 12. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, you go ahead and buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal, and Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day, that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Verse 10. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, he names her again. I like that the author keeps slapping Moabitess into the story so you don't forget that this girl is the source of the whole argument, that she's a Moabitess. The widow of Malon, I've acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And as if this isn't enough, our author decides to throw one more shot across the bow of the are you sure you have the moral high ground by having Boaz say the following. And all the people were at the gate. The elders said, we're witnesses. The Lord make the woman come to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. May you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. The author throws in a story that they would rather forget. A story about a kinsman redeemer that didn't do a very good job redeeming. And you know the Tamar prostitute story. We're going to open with that next time to find out the fact that when Matthew writes his genealogy, of Jesus. He reaches back into the Old Testament and he says, all right, I'm going to grab some characters that nobody wants to see in this genealogy to remind you that we all get, we are all accounted for in Christ. And Tamar is going to make it in. And Bathsheba is going to make it in. And Ruth's going to make it in. And Rahab the harlot's going to make it in. And it's all because I think, and this is where you got to shift your lens on reading it, it's all because the author is sending a message to the world to say, be careful who you reject. That could, be, that could have been your grandma. 
That could be your future daughter-in-law. That could be the person that you need tomorrow that you don't want anything to do with today. Be careful. Are you sure you have the high ground? And uh, Ruth is a story that screams across the ages, really speaks even, even to us today. I want to pray, and I want to pray release from the entrapment of the nearer kinsman. Somebody who watches who's been just ate up with toxic religion, and you are exhausted on it. You don't have to be a slave to the nearer kinsman. You have a, you have a kinsman, Jesus, who voluntarily takes you with your title. He doesn't just say, I love this girl. Boaz doesn't say, I love this girl. I want it to... He always names her and puts her title on it. He doesn't want it to look like he has forgotten where she's from. He has not forgotten where you're from. This is why it's okay for you to say you are a sinner and a saint. It's okay. I've been hard on that in the past. But I'm trying to read the Bible bottom up. And you need to remember that you are the Moabites. And that Jesus doesn't mask that over and go, oh, we're going to act like you're not that. We're just going to talk about what you are in heavenly places. And you go, no, you need to remember that I am this as well. And this is who you married. <laughs> like if you're going to have success in your marriage, you're going to have to bring the whole thing. Like you don't get to pick and choose the stuff you want to tell your spouse if you want this thing to be healthy. Now, if you want it to have cancer in it, and you want to destroy stuff down the road, then have house full of secrets. Have a heart full of stuff you won't let go of because you don't want them to know about it. And just get ready because I've told you this before and I'll say it again. Those snakes are turning into dragons and they will rear their head when you least expect it and when it's the worst possible moment for them to rear their head, they will. So bring your Moabite title to the wedding. And don't be shocked and when he marries you if Jesus still calls you the Moabitess. And don't shrivel back and go, oh no, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Go, yes, I am, but I'm still a Moabitess. And don't you forget it. And because I'm not going to forget it, I'm going to remember how much he loves me. And I'm going to remember how much he accepts me. And I'm going to remember how much he takes me in. And he doesn't reject me. He doesn't act like I'm not that. He accepts me even though I am that. That's true love. That's no masks. Let's pray that for this. For you, for them, for anyone who watches and listens. Thank you, Father. Thank you for Ruth, the Moabites. Um, thank you for this, the fact that you keep saying it over and over in this text so that I won't forget. Thank you that there is a nearer kinsman. It's called my conscience or my self-effort. Sometimes it's called the law. Sometimes it's called the law of sin and death. Whatever I call it, it wants to take from me, but it doesn't want to produce anything in me. It's willing to take my property, my joy, my peace. It's not willing to give me a future. It's not willing to give me a tomorrow. And then came Jesus. Thank you that you are our kinsman redeemer. That you buy what you buy our heart and you commit to us to bring forth fruit. I pray for everyone watching who is who's just now being confronted with the entrapment of their nearer kinsmen and may they be released and accept the love of our Boaz who is Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant built upon better promises in Jesus name. Amen.